we are very pleased to have uh, greg yang with us today greg yang is a well known researcher in machine learning uh, uh, one interesting thing is that he is already a well known researcher even without doing a phd and uh, during his undergrad for his undergrad thesis he won the morgan prize 2018 honorable mention and uh, today greg yang will be uh, telling us about tensor programs which is a frame, uh, 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 body of work that he has both introduced and developed and it has been and continues to be influential in uh, while it is a theoretical work it continues to be influential in the practice of deep learning over you over to you greg yeah uh, thanks so much praneeth for the invitation and my first time in india and it's a wonderful place to be it reminds me of home back in china um but oh can i get a, a bottle of water by the way uh okay so let's start um so you know whether you're an engineer or a scientist when you're faced with new problems uh the first thing of course is not to throw like 10 million dollars at the problem on the first uh, method you want to try but rather you want to shrink the problem to a small uh model problem and then try to explore various techniques uh, understand the problem uh, before you do any kind of scaling up so uh, you know for example in machine learning okay you have some language data set and uh, you took a kind of small transformer model you tried it out and like, things work pretty well and you might get uh, a training curve that looks like this um, let me laser point yes okay so everything looks great right now uh, in this small setting okay so now you know you, you can like you know throw 10 million dollars at the problem uh but of course you know if you're too confident uh then you're gonna see this uh very pathetic and unfortunate phenomenon where scaling up actually does significantly worse than uh the small model that you started with and of course uh if if the, if the problem really is a small problem then okay like this is not a big deal because you can always just like retune your hyperparameters, try different things on the larger scale. But you know, if you put your shoe, put your uh, feet in the shoes of you know like OpenAI or you know like these Google or these large companies trying to use large language models, I mean each of these can cost you know ten to hundred million dollars uh, these days. Then uh, it's really catastrophic to to see a phenomenon like this. Um, and really, you know, like when, when we want to train a large language model these days, the mindset is you want to kind of throw all your compute uh, at a single model. And so by definition, almost you cannot like try other options. You only have one try to make it work. So it's really like a one shot problem. And, and again, like when, when you try to scale naively, you will see a lot of these uh, problems I did not see in small scales, but you will emerge as you go to large scale. And of course, you know, this is very costly, but the, the hero of this story is doing the right mathematics. An example of what doing the right mathematics will allow you to do is to set all the hyperparameters that you care about correctly so that you will get, you know, the, the optimal performance uh, in the large model without, on, on first try, essentially, without trying uh, all the other options. So, uh, the the technique underlying this is called Maxwell differentialization, abbreviated UP, and uh, it's something you can already use today. Uh, for example, by doing pip install UP if you are a PyTorch user. Um, but the the idea here is really quite simple. It's just a principal way of scaling initialization and learning rate with the width of the neural network. The width is just the number of neurons per layer backed by some beautiful mathematics. I'll talk about you know, uh, this lecture and also over the next two lectures. Okay, so I'm gonna flash you a table right now. Bam, this is a table. It's probably kind of incomprehensible right now, but uh, the point here is this little table, even though it's a bit sophisticated and incomprehensible right now, encapsulates all the information that really, you really need to implement UP. So in the, at the end of the day, it's a really simple notion. But uh, okay, don't don't worry about the table right now. I'll, call, I'll come back to this table later to understand, uh, interpret what it means. But let's just look at what MUP does. Okay, so the reason we like MUP is uh, it has these two properties. So it has hyperparameter stability and the larger is better property. Okay, so to understand what I mean by these properties, it helps to actually look at a, a negative example of this. So if you look at uh, the standard parameterization, which is you know, what you would use by default 
if you were to, you know, like uh, put out a neural network in PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, these kind of uh, deep learning uh, frameworks, and you, you know, take your favorite neural network, can be transformer, can be convolution neural network, whatever, and sweep a hyperparameter, say learning rate on the X axis and plot the training performance on the Y axis, then usually you see a curve like this. Okay, so like, you know, there's like an optimal zone where the hyperparameters lie. Okay, I mean, this is very uh, typical, nothing strange about this. Now you repeat this experiment as you scale up your model size. And uh, a lot of times you see a set of curves like this. And this is where, you know, it's a bit more interesting. Well, you see two phenomena here. One is that this, the optimal zone of hyperparameters is shifting as you become larger and larger. And the other one is that, you know, if you uh, say like you fix any uh, X coordinate, which is a hyperparameter value and you increase the model size. So you go to the darker and darker curves. You see uh, the performance is not monotonic actually. So like, for example, if you take the best hyperparameter on the smallest model and you try to just travel up uh, the, the curves, right? So then you see that like, as you uh, model gets larger and larger, actually at this point, the performance peaks and then it dips, right? And uh, a lot of cases, even if you optimize for the hyperparameters, the optimal performance will also dip. Okay, so obviously this is not optimal. Like how can you, you know, train like a 10 times larger model and get worse performance? Like that doesn't, it's not logical, right? So, so again, this is the negative example of these two properties, hyperparameter stability and larger is better. Now, if you look at mu p, again, I didn't tell you what mu p is yet, but if you, you know, take some description of it and you implement it, uh, and you repeat this uh, experiment, you'll find the set of uh, curves. So here, the, uh, you know, the, hyper, the optimal hyperparameters for each curve is stable as you increase the width of the model. And if you, uh, you know, for, for any, you know, point on the x-axis, you fix it and you increase the width, right, you always gain something. So, so again, these, this is an exemplification of the hyperparameter stability and larger is better property. Question? Yes. Is the amount of training data the same as you increase the model size in these curves? Yeah, so here I'm just like fixing everything and only change width, okay? Uh, you can, so, so you can also talk about changing data set, uh, data set size. That's like a the question you can ask in a, on top of this baseline where you fix everything and then you change width. Uh, I guess like increasing model size at some point might degrade the performance because of uh, generalization. If you just fix the data set size, right? So that also doesn't seem as surprising. Oh, but, but here I'm just talking about training performance, not even talking about generalization. Okay, here. okay, okay. Right, so this is like, okay. you know, not talking about overfitting or anything. Oh, you have a question? Uh, it's, it, no, it doesn't have to be concave. It, it can be like, I think a lot of times it's like quasi concave or so, uh, but this is just like cartoon. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you, in fact, the next slide, I'll show you what a real picture looks like. Uh, this is what a real picture looks like on an actual uh, transformer train on Wikitext2 uh, via Atom. Okay, so don't worry about if you, if you don't know what these terms mean, just some, you know, uh, trans some steady R uh, neural network model on some relevant data sets. Um, but, you know, again, like the last slide was, was a cartoon, but here essentially you have uh, very similar patterns. On the x-axis, uh, you're plotting the learning rate. On the y-axis, you're plotting the training loss. Again, like training, I like know overfitting phenomenon discussed here. And uh, the different colors indicate different uh, widths. And on the left, again, you have the standard practice of using kind of the default parameterization. And uh, what you observe is that the optimal learning rate, which is where the dips occur in each curve, will shift uh, as you increase the model size, right? And secondly, you know, if you were to take, you know, like the best hyperparameter on the smallest model, for example, which is right here, and then you apply it to the largest model, which is, you know, the, this black curve here, uh, you're gonna obviously have a very bad time. And this could be an explanation for uh, this uh, learning curve that you saw in the beginning where, you know, scaling up naively just gives you broken dreams and nothing else. Um, on the other hand, uh, on the right, uh, when you use mu p, you see that the, the optimum learning rate is stable as you increase the model size. Uh, and you always uh, gain something, some performance, 
when you uh, increase the model size, right? Like you don't, you don't see any kind of like curve crossing here or darker curves lying above the, the lighter curves. Okay, so this is a very stereotypical picture of uh, using mu p is that you have this like foliation of the, the uh, phase space in some sense. Okay, so this is a, you know, uh, this, the most stereotypical hyperparameter, the learning rate. Uh, but really the, the power of this method really comes from the fact that you can simultaneously apply uh, mu p and uh, simultaneously uh, transfer a lot of uh, different hyperparameters at the same time. So for example, here I have four sets of plots. There's learning array uh, cross entropy temperature, which is like a multiplier on the output of the network, uh, initialization standard deviation, and a learning rate schedule. Uh, the last of which is a discrete hyperparameter um, consisting of like six representative uh, learning rate schedules used in practice. And again, the point here is that uh, as you scale up the model, which corresponds to darkening of the colors, um, the optimal the optimal hyperparameters, which is where you know the minimum occurs, is stable, uh, and uh, essentially you can guess what the uh, optimal hyperparameter of the largest model is by just looking at where the dip is in the smallest model. And uh, for this learning rate schedule, you just want to observe that ordering between the six different options are consistent as you increase the model size. So this uh, can be summarized by the following. Uh, this box right here, which is that, which says that essentially for you know like uh, any um, combination of hyperparameters gamma, which in this uh, you know in this slide it just consists of learning rate uh, cross cross entropy temperature initialization learning rate schedule so on and so forth. Um, if you look at the argument of the the loss uh, the training loss obtained by the model as a function of gamma and, and the width. But you argument over gamma, then this value is roughly invariant as with uh, increases. Okay, so this is essentially the key insight. Uh, I haven't ex I haven't uh, explained why this should be the case. I'm just telling you this is kind of the the, the essence behind this uh, hyperparameter transfer phenomenon. Okay, so uh, and then then it's very obvious, right? Like once you have this phenomenon, you know you can just uh, guess the, the right algorithm to do here. So this is something we call mu transfer or zero shot hyperparameter transfer. And the point here, of course, is that, you know, instead of throwing $10 million, uh, you know, for each hyperparameter combination you wanna try directly on the large model, uh, you, you shrink the large model to a very tiny size and then tune the, the tiny, tiny model very aggressively. And then you, you just copy the hyperparameters back to the large model. And uh, of course, the key here at the end of the day is that the shrinking and the you know the copying needs to be done in mu p. Like this is the key. Right? If you if you don't shrink the model uh, using this parameterization, or you do it using the default parameterization, this is not going to work. Right? As you know, the previous plots have demonstrated. Okay. So uh, you know, enough talk, right? Like, actually, show me where the money is. So we validated this, uh, uh, everything I've said so far on models of increasing scale. So, you know, from, you know, tiny MLP on CIFAR-10 all the way to GPT-3, uh, 6.7 billion parameter model in collaboration with OpenAI. And, uh, you know, we have lots and lots of plots which you can find in the paper, but, you know, let me kind of summarize the key lessons here. The first lesson is that um, when you apply mu p, to these existing models, right, which are hand tuned uh, by default, you can look at like what is the the gain of using this technique over the hand tuned baseline, right, which is like the best you know human hand tuned baseline. Um, and what we find is that as the model size increases, the improvement due to mu transfer, due to doing the math correctly actually increases with the model size. So as it gets more expensive to, to tune models, you actually also gain more performance, right? So um, at first, it's, maybe it's kind of unintuitive because usually you would think, okay, like, you know, I have one technique, I try it on a really, uh, a really good model. I, I expect 
less improvement than I expect on a, on a worse model because you know, like it's much harder to improve 99% accurate model by 1% than 50% accurate model by 1%. But here you have the inverse relation, right? Where the better, better model actually improves more due to this technique. But if you really think about it, what this says is that like, the, like without doing the right mathematics, it's very, very hard to guess, to extrapolate what the right hyperparameters are for the large models because you only have like one or two shots to really make it work. So like just people are bad at doing it. Okay, so that's the first lesson that the improvement due to mean transfer increases as the model size increases. And secondly, uh, the tuning cost, uh, the total tuning cost of obtaining the right hyperparameters as a fraction of the training cost of the, the final large model actually decreases inversely proportional to the model size. Okay, so, uh, oh wait. Hold on. Oh, the, the slides were not updated, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's fine now. Uh, so yeah, in the second, in the, in the plot below, you see that the, the, the cost, the fractional cost of tuning actually decreases to zero as the model size becomes large. Right, this is you know a total inversion of you know a, a, a engineer's intuition of tuning. Tuning means something costly usually because you can try you know, ten different combinations of hyperparameters you know to get something reasonable. So so the cost of tuning is usually like ten times the training cost. But here here you have a, a total inversion of that intuition where the tuning cost actually goes to zero uh, as a fraction of the final training cost. And again, like the the, the reason here is just that. By doing the right mathematics, you have discovered a way to tune the model on a fixed proxy, fixed size proxy. So the tuning cost essentially is constant in absolute scale. So as a fraction of the, the final training cost is decreasing to zero because the training cost is increasing to infinity. Okay, so to give you some concrete numbers on these two lessons, you know that we can look at our collaboration with OpenAI on GPT-3. So uh, to tune this 6.7 billion parameter model, of GPT-3, we uh, shrunk the model to a 40 million parameter model. So this is like a 150 time difference in the model size. And um, when we tune the small model and then, you know, of course, eventually the large model using UP, we found that um, the 6.7 billion parameter model uh, after mu transfer is essentially as good as the original 13 billion parameter model in the GPT-3 family. So effectively double the model size. Um, and uh, the, the cost, the, the fractional cost of the whole tuning, which was very aggressive on a, on a small model is uh, only 7%, right? So this is really approaching negligible territory. And, uh, and OpenAI will be happy to tell you that like if you only cost 7%, they're happy to do it 10 more times. So, okay. so. This is a quick summary of you know, the, the empirical properties of mu p and why we like it so much and why it's uh, so valuable for you know, large language models for these general intelligence models. Um, the plan next is to actually tell you what mu p is, which I haven't done, and, um, and, and to actually tell you how like, this notion was derived in the first place. Okay. But uh, let me pause here. Any questions so far? Anybody's confused? Okay. So um, oh, let's, let's look at what MUP actually is. So uh, the easiest way to get some intuition is to start uh, with uh, a multi-layer perception. Line. So uh, let's look at this equation, which is uh, which is describes a three-layer uh, multi-layer perceptron with uh, weights uh, w1, w2, w3. And um, if you look at you know the default way this is parameterized is initialized and the, the learning rate, uh, the, the initialization is uh, sampling the w1 and w2, w3, the, the weights with variance one over fan n or fan is number of neurons going to that layer. So as an example, like W1, the input layer weights will be sampled variance one over dn, or dn is the data dimension, the dimension of xi. And then W2 and three 
are sampled uh, with variance one over n, where n is the width model. Um, and the biases, uh, for simplicity, it just assume it's initialized at zero, but you can be trained. And then there's like one number, eta, for the, for the learning rate of the entire network, right? This is how usually it's done. Okay, so, you know, you can just take this description and then you run the network, you run the experiments that we discussed many times already. So you get this set of curves. You know, this is a really ugly set of curves. You know, you have um, all, the, all the curves are crossing uh, between uh, the different widths, uh, which indicates that, you know, you, you can like actually do worse when you increase the model size. And uh, the optimal hyperparameter here is shifting to the left as you increase the model size. Okay, so this is obviously not desirable. So let's see how uh, MEP tries to fix the situation. Okay, so the, um, the modification that MEP makes is, in, uh, is highlighted by the purple. So there are three modifications. Uh, there's a modification of initialization of the last layer, a modification in the learning rate of the last layer, and a modification in the learning rate of the first layer and the biases, okay? So uh, the initialization of the last layer scaled down, the, the learning rate of the last layer scaled down, and the learning rate for the input and biases are scaled up. So very likely at this point, you're like, WTF, dude, uh, what does this mean? Like, why, why, why do you make these modifications? Um, and this is a totally natural reaction. So, you know, don't, don't be afraid if you just like can't comprehend why uh, these are the way it is. But, you know, for, for the moment, if you just take this description and you run the experiments uh, on the left, but with mu p, you get this uh, beautiful set of curves where the, you know, the optimal learning rate is stable as you, incre you increase the model size. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the curves are foliating the space. There's no crossing of curves anywhere. So everything looks beautiful. Okay, now let's discuss um, why MEP makes the modifications uh, presented here. In particular, this uh, so this warm up is is about giving you some intuition of why like we're making modifications. Uh, what are the reasons behind some modifications? But I'm not going to talk about kind of like the deep underlying uh, theory behind this until uh, the next lecture. But, but let's try to give you some intuition uh, over at least these two modifications, which is the scaling down of the last layer of initialization and the learning rate. So um, again, here's the neural network. Uh, it's the same equation as, as this, except for I'm just writing out this dot product at the very end between W3 and this embedding as a sum, right? So it's a sum over n elements. Uh, each element is W3, an entry W3 times the entry of the embedding, which I abbreviate as V, da, da, da. So um, the first thing that you can notice is that like each entry of this V, da, 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 like each entry of the embedding, will have typical size theta one. So what I mean by that is that uh, as width becomes large, the typical size of each entry of this embedding is not gonna blow up to infinity. It's not gonna shrink to zero, okay? So um, this is a fairly easy exercise that you can uh, think about yourself, but you can also make phi like hyperbolic tangent or something, which will make the, this conclusion uh, even easier to come by. So let's just assume this for now that uh, this is uh, the case that each entry of phi has typical size theta one. Okay, so then with this uh, in mind, we can see that the role of these two modifications are to ensure that each entry of W3, the upper weights have typical size one over N. So let me remind you that N here again is the width model, which is um, kind of the internal dimensions uh, of this neural network number of neurons in the hidden layers. Um, okay, so let's, let's see why these modifications make, uh, make sure that W3 has entry size one over N. Well, initialization, you see we're sampling W3's entry with variance one over N squared. So that's standard deviation one over N. 
So the, the standard deviation one of n automatically makes W3 have typical size one of n. Okay, so we're good to go there. Now, when we start the train, let's look at how is W3 updated? Well, the, the update to W3 is the learning rate, which is this number, times uh, the gradient to W3, which is like a, a output derivative times this embedding here by the product rule of differentiation. And uh, because you know, we have seen that this, uh, each entry of phi has typical size theta one, and the learning rate now is size n inverse, the product of them ensures that the update to W3 has size uh, one over n as well, right? As n becomes large. So what this implies is that, you know, again, initialization, we make sure that W3 has one over n size. Uh, and uh, in each update, you also ensure that the update has size one over n. So this, you know, inductively, inductively ensures that W3 has typical size one over n throughout training, where, uh, you know, I'm omitting any dependence on the training time and like data set, whatever, only expressing the dependence on the width. Okay, so you know that that seems maybe like much ado about nothing. So why does this uh, why does this matter that W three has typical size one over n? Well, you're summing up n things, right? And each thing has size one over n times one, which is one over n. So uh, in total, you can see that this means that the sum can be at most constant, typically, typical over kind of the random initializations, uh, because you're summing up n things each of one over n. But you could, they could cancel. You could have like a central limit kind of behavior where you know you have a screw root cancellation, for example, in the sum, uh, which is indeed what happens in initialization. But the final piece of insight here is that um, this the W three the entry uh, entries of the output and uh, the entries and embedding, they will become correlated during training. So um, this 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 means that like when you do the sum you actually have a non-zero mean in each uh, entry. So the sum, the sum will pick out the non-zero mean and like, suppress any fluctuation of the individual terms. So the final uh, conclusion here is that instead of O1 here, you actually have theta one typically in, uh, in that the, the output of the network will not shrink, shrink to zero either. You you be just some number between you know not going to zero and not going to infinity as width becomes large. Okay, so you know you might wonder. Okay, I mean, all right, like okay, neural network you know, doesn't blow up, doesn't shrink to zero. Why, why do we care about that? Well, I mean, we had to implement these things on computers, and computers um, have you know limited uh, numerical precision. And this is you know you might think this is a very academic uh, discussion, but uh, these days, large neural networks, large language models are trained using very low precision, you know, flow, flowing point 16 or even lower precision. And really like, you know, going out of range is the bane of uh, the existence of AI engineers, no joke. So this is, it's actually quite um, uh, important that like the, the range of the relevant quantities here, uh, which includes the output of the network is in a constant range as you, you know, uh, become large. But even you know, setting aside the numerical, the engineering problems, there is also a mathematical problem where if uh, the, the output of the network becomes uh, you know, too big or too small, then you can go out of the effective range of the loss function and your, so the gradient will also become uh, ill-conditioned. So um, that's just to say that you, know, you can see that there's, there are like, can be very subtle problems when you, become, when you uh, make a neural network very large. And uh, this is a typical example of some scale problem that occurs when you uh, make your neural network very wide. And uh, you know, so if you, if you go back and remove these modifications and look at the standard parameterization, you can redo the calculation we just did and you'll find that the, um, the output of the network will actually blow up linearly with the width model. Um, and uh, that will you know, trigger all these problems that we talked about numerical position or algorithmic stability. Okay, so any question? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so how do you propose to initialize a larger model with a small model? Yeah, so, so it's, not, it's not that trivial. Um, so people have uh, worked on various aspects of this, but I don't think they're that successful. The conclusion, this is more like, you need to, uh, when you scale your model, you need to scale uh, the initialization scales of your weights and the learning rates of your different layers appropriately. If you don't do it, then you're gonna break your model. Okay, so, uh, so that brings us to the table I flashed you at the very beginning, but I did not explain, but now we are actually in a position we can actually make sense of something of it. So in this table, each row is uh, a um, hyperparameter. So for example, the variance of the initialization, uh, the random sampling of the weights, the learning rate for uh, if you're using SGD as the optimizer, uh, we're learning rate if you're using Atom as an optimizer. If you don't know what Atom is, you know, don't worry about it. Just forget the last row. Um, but in the example we just saw, you know, we, we looked at how we should scale the neutralization variance and the SGD learning rate. In the columns, we have different parts of the neural network. So we have the input weights and biases. We have the output weights. We have the hidden weights. Um, and the entries tells you how should you scale these hyperparameters, uh, you know, corresponding to each row for each part of the network corresponding to the columns. Um, and you can see, of course, there's some colors here in the entries. And the way you read this is that the purple plus black gives you mu p and then the gray plus black gives you the standard parameterization or sp. Uh, that's the baseline, that's the default right now. Um, okay, so let's look at some of the entries, right? So, you know, if you look at the output weights, under the output weights, you have one over fan n squared and one over fan in for the variance and the learning rate, which is uh, exactly this, right? Um, and uh, we also, you know, talk about the, the learning rate uh, for the input weights and biases. I did not explain that, but uh, you can see here it's scaled up by factor N and this corresponds to a scaling uh, of, uh, scaling up by factor fan out in this case. So, so just to recall, fan in means the number of neurons going to the, the layer and fan out means the number of neurons coming out of that layer. Okay, so it's a different notions of width. Um, yeah. and, uh, uh, and just to remark that, you know, uh, when we, we're talking about large language models, large transformers these days, we're usually talking about these models trained by Adam. So it's not sufficient to just understand how SGDs should scale. And, uh, and, uh, but it turns out it's very easy to actually send the scaling to Atom, where, where you just make the um, upper weights and hidden weights, a learning rate scale uh, like one or fan in, and then you're done. Okay. But I won't talk about uh, much of this Atom business. Um, it's a bit more advanced. Question? Yes. So uh, is it fair to summarize that the main intuition is that the, uh, all the, so in the forward pass, all the activations are O of one? each individual value. And at least at initialization, the backward pass, all the gradients are of the same magnitude as the weight, uh, uh, as the initialization. Uh, is that? Uh... Yeah, so, so in the next lecture, we will talk about exactly this. It's not, what you said literally is not correct. There is like some spirit in which it is correct. Uh, and we'll see in what spirit is it correct. Essentially, you're, you're not using the right norms to talk about size here. Uh, I was thinking of like each individual value and its variance. Yeah, so that's not the correct size. That's not okay. the correct notion of size to look at. And we'll see uh, why that is the case and what is the correct size to look at. Okay. It's only the norm. What is the right notion of norm to compare different parts of the neural network? And uh, so what's the main difference between SGD and Adam? So SGD is e easier to understand. Adam because of, uh, I guess like both of these are like, this is still at initialization, right? So at initialization, SGD and Adam will probably have the same update. So what's the main difference between uh, the SGD yeah. uh, things? And yeah, uh, so, uh, I mean, so, so, so first of all, you know, like this works for, you know, any number of training sets. So it's not just looking at initialization. Um, and uh, I mean, the main difference between SGD and Adam is that Adam renormalizes the uh, gradients before you apply the updates. So it's, it's roughly, roughly like an entry-wise, normalization, like you can think of Adam as like a general, more general version or a momentum version of 
sine SGD, where you, you take the gradient, you take the sine of it, like plus minus one sine of the gradient, and then you apply it to your weights. So, so roughly it normalizes the uh, gradients entry-wise. But SGD doesn't, doesn't do that, right? Because SG, like the, so it turns out the natural uh, range of the gradient uh, of SGD uh, for the middle layer is like something like one over width or something like that. So then the entry size will be on the order of one over n. But after you apply the atom uh, processing, it becomes order one. So this is why like, you need to have different learning rates to compensate for this different scale. Basically, you're also able to estimate how the gradient norms will uh, evolve, and then you're correcting for that in Adam in, this, in that sense. So then there should not be a difference between using SGD versus Adam because you are already correcting for the norms in the learning rates, right? Uh, oh yeah, but uh, you mean like in practice, there should not be? Uh, I mean, at least in theory, it should not be, like, it seems like the goal is to make both of them follow similar dynamics, at least in theory. Is that the case or no? Uh, similar dynamics in terms of scaling with width, but you can still have different dynamics in when you train for longer, longer time. Like the time dynamics can be different between them, right? Because I mean, like Adam has momentum, for example. Like, that's obvious. Sure, yeah, yeah. SGD. But like the uh. scaling with width will be the same. You will not see blow up. You will not sh see like shrinkage to zero, mm -hmm. that kind of business. No, I guess I was thinking Adam, not with momentum, but only with preconditioning. And uh, for that, you're explicitly accounting for in the learning rates. And uh, you mean Adam, vanilla Adam with no scaling at all here, like this? Uh, no, I'm saying Adam has two components, right? One is momentum. Yeah. The other one is uh, uh, like uh, multiplying parameter coordinate wise learning rates using like the historical variance and so yeah, on. Yeah. So I'm saying if I just use the historical variance to scale different updates differently, uh, for that, it seems like you're accounting the learning rates here to take care of that. Uh, uh, yeah, so, right. So, so if you remove the like, the, the, the first order momentum in Adam, then like the skating in this last row will still apply. It's the same. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. The by, do you really mean parameters or hyperparameters? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so uh, first of all, you know, a direct answer to your question is that you can see the way the learning rates are shifting is different from different parts of the neural network. So the naive way of doing things is you tie all the learning rates together. And that means that you have to make compromises between like satisfying, you, you wanna make sure the last layer don't learn too fast, but then because you're tying a learning rate, you, you, you then make the middle of the layer learn too slowly, right? So you cannot satisfy everybody, which is the reason that like, you know, earlier in the slides, um, okay, maybe uh, like early in the slides, you can see that like the, when you scale, when you go larger and larger, even if you account for the shift in learning rate in the standard transformation, performance just gets worse and worse compared to the, the mu prime transition. So, so, okay, so that's the direct answer. The general answer is that really that the, the true hyperparameter space is not a one dimensional space of the learning rate. That's just sh too short sighted. The, 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 the true space is a very high dimensional space that includes, you know, at least initialization learning rate for every layer of the network. And when you only look at a one dimensional space, the subspace of learning rate, you're like, you're just looking at one of these uh, slides. And the true, the true optimum in that large space is shifting away from that one D slice as you get larger and larger. So even if you optimize in this one D slice, that optimum is getting far, farther and farther away from the true optimum in the large space. All right, so let's try to move on. I don't know what, how much time I have left. Um, okay, so uh, I'll try to um, give you some intuition. Uh, I'll try to give you some intuition. I'll try to give you some intuition uh, about how mu p came about and like contextualize it in uh, in, in uh, some other stuff. 
So first of all, let's let's talk about parameterization. I've used that word a couple of times now, and, uh, and the slides are not updating again. Okay, there you go. So uh, I, I have used this word parameterization a couple of times right now, up to up till now, and um, the the what I mean by parameterization is a very specific meaning. So you know, you saw you saw the the table earlier of um, UP, and a parameterization is just any particular way of filling this table, right? So like, you know, I fill this table in a very particular way to get mu p, but you can, you know, replace this with, you know, say any other, you know, power scaling uh, of fan in or fan out, uh, however you want to fill this table, and that defines a parameterization, okay? So um, it, it, it is a, a set of rule uh, that tells you how to scale your hyperparameter when the model size changes. So you can say something like half the learning rate when the width doubles, Okay, but it's not, it's not something that's a bit more typical in deep learning, which is, you know, like it doesn't tell you how to set specific values of hyperparameter at specific model sizes. So you'll never say use exactly learning rate one negative three exactly with no need for. That's something that you will never say. Um, and the reason we, we like this former notion of parameterization is because there is, they, I mean, there turns out to be a universal parameterization in some sense. Uh, and this coarser notion of, you know, is more amenable to universality. Like it's more possible to, for it to be universal versus this latter notion uh, of parameterization, which is very specific. And, you know, like learning a one negative 20, uh, one negative three is probably not gonna work for some data sets. Right? Okay, so this is my definition of parameterization, how, how, how you should scale your hyperparameters as your model size changes. And one way to visualize this is as a flow of hyperparameters uh, with respect to the width of the neural network, uh, in this case. So, uh, for example, on the left, I'm just I'm just drawing cartoons here. Like, don't take this literally, but like, and on the x-axis, I have like hyperparameters. Again, the true space hyperparameters are very high dimensional, but here I'm only drawing one dimension because, you know, humans are only good at visually visualizing one or two dimensions. Uh, but on the y-axis, I have uh, the width. Okay. And mu p can be visualized as a particular way of flowing a hyperparameter at width 100 uh, toward width to infinity, right? So in this case, uh, in log log scale, things just look like straight lines, right? Because everything is power scaling. And you know, if you look at sp, the default in PyTorch, it's another way of scaling. In the same space, it just you know goes straight up. You know, for example, if you take the naive way of describing hyperparameters, then SP just goes straight up. Again, you know, you can see that there are many, many possible ways of scaling your hyperparameters, different ways to flow your hyperparameters from with 100 to with infinity, right? Many, many different ways. Um, and again, you recall, you want to remember that like roughly the, the parameterization is a, is a flow uh, it, or in this particular simple, you know, power scaling is kind of the slope of the flow. It's not about the intercept, it's, it's, a, it's a slope, okay? And it defines a direction toward infinite width. Um, now, you know, the, the, the key premise of, you know, this conversation is that, you know, we somehow could predict the optimal hyperparameters of large models. Now, if you're God, of course, you can see how the optimal hyperparameters will traverse the space as width becomes large. But, you know, as mere mortals with limited compute, you can only ever see a very small segment of uh, this curve, right? So maybe you can only see this part of the curve. Um, so when you, uh, when you want to predict really large uh, models hyperparameters, you essentially are asking yourself, how do the optimal hyperparameters flow you know, for sufficiently large neural networks? And you know, using this pictorial language I just set up, um, Roughly, this is saying, you know, which parameterization do they follow asymptotically, or what's the asymptotic slope of this curve of the optimal hyperparameters that God can see, but we cannot see, right? And if you can answer this question, it will give you the hyperparameter transfer uh, that we were talking about earlier that mu p has. Of course, I mean, the answer to these questions is mu p, but like, how do we arrive at this, right? And the, the key uh, insight here is that, you know, for, you can like think about how you know like these flows uh, work. 
And you know, for different parameterizations, he's flowing you know, a, any specific hyperparameters toward different parts of the hyperparameter space. So SP will flow it you know, to this particular space. Uh, mu P will flow this chunk of hyperparameters to some other parts of space and so on and so forth. And as width goes to infinity, you actually arrive at limit objects, essentially infinite width neural networks, which has uh, all different properties depending on how you flew, how you flowed the um, hyperparameters to uh, the endpoint of infinite width. And, and you know, there's an obvious bijection between parameterizations and infinite width neural networks because parameterization exactly defines how to take an infinite width limit. And conversely, infinite width neural network you know, has to be defined by the definition of the limit. Um, so again, in the pictorial language, like this, the parameterization is like the slope and um, the infinite width neural network is like you know, the, the end of the rainbow when you traverse to the end of the world. Again, the question is what is the optimal parameterization? And uh, again, the answer you already know is mu p, but how do we arrive at this? So the, the key thesis here is what I call the optimal scaling thesis. I mean, at face value, this is you know, not uh, very sophisticated. But earlier, I just said that there's a bijection between parameterization and infinite width neural networks. And the optimal scaling thesis just says that, okay, like instead of a bijection between this larger space of parameterizations and infinite width limits, if you just only look at the optimal parameterizations, it's also bijective with the optimal limit, whatever the optimal means here. Well, the, the optimal parameterization by that, I mean, it has the property of hyperparameter stability. It preserves the hyperparameter optimums as you uh, scale the model size. And you always gain some performance when you increase the model size. So you know, this is the, the two properties I talked at the very beginning uh, that MUP has, if you remember these set of curves. And on the right, what I, what I mean by optimal limit, this is a bit more nebulous because you know, I have uh, not really talked about the concepts up until now, but you know, like roughly speaking, the optimal limit is the one that maximizes feature learning without blowing up, which is something I call maximum limit. But you know, don't worry about exactly what this means right now because I don't expect you to understand based on the setup I have given in this talk so far. But you can notice that this is a very interesting thing with this optimal scaling thesis, which is that on the left, if you have the optimal parameterization, it's like you have the ring in the Lord of the Rings. It's something that's very powerful and you can like, train very powerful models with it. And on the right, it's a purely ideal object. It's a purely mathematical and theoretical object. It doesn't exist in practice. Um, but like the optimal scaling thesis posits this direct connection between them. And something is, is one of those rare things so, so far in deep learning where if you make advance on the right side, theoretically a mathematical breakthrough, you will channel directly onto the left side. You can make you train you know, twice or 10 times better models immediately. And this is a very, very interesting uh, proposition uh, in the field of at least, you know, theoretical deep learning, which I think we haven't really seen up until now. And uh, you can notice that I've only focused on the notion of width um, uh, up until now, but uh, this is really a notion of, uh, this is a thesis for any notion of model size, so, which includes width and uh, can also include depth and number of experts in MOE models and so on and so forth. But okay, I'm only gonna focus on width here. Okay, so to, uh, to, to convince you that this is actually, um, to finally convince you that mu p is the optimal parameterization, um, I'm gonna show you a, uh, an animation before uh, I stop here, but um, so what this shows you is, uh, again, uh, it, it tries to show you that, you know, there is a uh, large space of parameterization um, that you should have in your mind. And um, mu p is the optimal parameterization in this space. So, okay, so what, what exactly is going on here? Well, on the right side, I'm plotting a two dimensional subspace of the space of parameterizations. Um, and uh, this green dot is traversing this 2D plane, which interpolates mu p and uh, the PyTorch default or standard parameterization or SP. Um, and then on the left, you have uh, these uh, scaling curves that you've seen many times already. 
where different curves correspond to different model widths. X axis is learning rate, Y axis is training loss. And at any given moment, the, the way the hyperparameters are scaled on the left side is uh, prescribed by whatever parameterization the green dot is on on the right side. Okay. So what, should, what you should take away here is that only when the green dot is on UP, like right now, is it the case that the optimal learning rate is stable with, with the model and uh, the curves are not intersecting and you know, better, uh, bigger models get better performance, okay? This is the only place where this is true. At any other given uh, position of the green dot, which corresponds to some uh, parameterization that interpolates you know, mu p and s p, you see that you see these properties violated. Right? You see the shifting of the optimal hyperparameters or the crossing of the curves. Okay. Okay. So again, the point here is that mu p really is the optimal parameterization in these two senses. It has hyperparameter stability and it has this larger is better problem. Um, okay. In the interest of time, I'll stop here. But in the next uh, next lecture, I'll explain. Uh, the theoretical insight behind this, why this should be true uh, for the width case. And um, yeah, we'll go from there. Thank you.